Um, I want to I want to read in Matthew chapter seven. We've been in a series called Missed Connections, Missed Connections, and and what we're doing is we're just realizing or not just realizing, but we're looking at areas in the Bible that are connected. God has actually um, been, been writing this thing from the very beginning, 66 different books, multiple authors, um, but they're all interconnected across thousands of years and generations. And what I love about the songs that we just sang is that we serve a generational God, that for thousands of years, God has been here and he's been, he's been worshiped and Jesus has died on the cross thousands of years ago. And it's no less true then as it is today that Jesus is still alive. And so we're just looking at the connections through his word. Some of the things that God has merged together. And I want to read this story today, but this is something Jesus had preached in Matthew chapter seven. Uh, Sermon on the Mount, and he, he says these words, and I, I, I just want to read them. It's going to be the anchor for this morning. It says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be open. So there's this principle Jesus is teaching where he's saying, hey, ask. Ask, and you receive. Knock, and it will be open to you. And there's this story in John chapter three, and there's a, a religious leader by the name of Nicodemus. I, I, I grew up in church, right? So the kids ministry was Nick at night. Anybody learned it, Nick at night? You know what I'm saying? And so Nick at night, Nicodemus would come uh, and he just knocked on Jesus's door. But this is, this is what it says in John chapter three, verse one. It says, there was a man of the Pharisees. They're just letting you know he's of high renown. He's wealthy. He's educated. He's, he's a leader and a teacher named Nicodemus. And he's a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night. There it is. Nick at night. Come on. Shout out to kids ministry, right? They just make it memorable. I'm, I'm, I'm be 32 this week and I still remember Nick at night. You know what I'm saying? It says, he came at night and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. Come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And he and this teacher have a long discourse for the rest of this chapter about different things when in context may not make a whole lot of sense to us today, um, but I'm believing we're going to make some connections. Amen? Amen. Come on, let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word. I'm grateful that it's active. It's transformative, that when we read it, open it, take it in, and then apply it to our lives, our lives change. And God, I just pray that we would apply the word today. You transform mindsets. You transform hearts in only the way that you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I wanted to, I wanted to just talk about misconnections for a second because misconnections is what we've been talking about. It's a social media thing. You might find it on Craigslist, but it's, it's when you meet somebody but didn't have a chance to kind of swap contacts, and so you, you reach out to the interwebs, and you're like, hey, help me find somebody, you know? And, and so you hop on the Googles and you hop on, on, on the tweeters and you'd send all these things out and you're like, hey, come, I, I got to know. I got to like help me find this individual. Um, and actually one of the most famous missed connections happened in 2015 uh, and, he, and, and, and it went by the name of the dancing man. Anybody, anybody, can we get that first? Anybody seen this? So this is the dancing man. And somebody had actually posted it on on. on social media as a public shame post, Uh, but don't worry, the story redemption is about to be incredible. It says, spotted this specimen trying to dance the other week. He stopped when he saw us laughing. And so somebody saw this post on social media and it was a missed connection. They're like, we gotta do something about this. So they said, anyone know who this man is or maybe who posted this? Because there's a huge group of ladies in LA who would like to do something special. And it went viral on, on, on Twitter. It's being shared and shared and shared. And then, and then check this out. Go, go to the next one. It says, dancing man, we don't know much about you, but a photo on the internet suggested that you wanted to dance and you were made to feel like you shouldn't be. 
We want to see you dance freely, and if you would have us, we would love to dance with you. We are prepared to throw quite a dance party just for you, if you'd have us. To be clear, it's 1,700 of us, <laughs> and we're all women. Come on, some women's group was like, we're going we gonna to throw a dancing man party. And then I love it. Here's the disclaimer. If this isn't appealing, we're okay with that. We're okay with taking no for an answer, but we'd like you to know the offer stands. May we have this dance sincerely and occasionally over-enthusiastic group of young women in California, hashtag fine dancing man. The next one, for all Williams sees it on Twitter, and he says, hey Cassandra, uh, keep me posted about your dance party. At Dancing Man Found, never be ashamed of yourself because you both are truly other. There's a DJ that comes on and says, I'm going to offer my DJ services for free if we find the dancing man. No one should be ever made ashamed about dancing. And everybody who's ever been to a wedding, can I get an amen? <laughs> you know who you are. Table nine, on looking, checking it out. I'm that person. Depends on the wedding, though. Some weddings, you know what I mean? I'm dancing, some I'm not, I don't know. We'll see, but... But no one should be made ashamed about dancing. And then go to the next one. Check this out. This is, this is amazing. Hey, Cass, and Twitter, as requested, the dancing man is found. He's in the UK. I some, come on. There's power behind social media. It can be used for good. It's just a tool. And he said, hey, I found you guys. Go to the next one. And here he is at the party, the dancing man party, dancing Away, go to the next one. If there is one more, I don't remember. No, that might be it. So they find them, and they throw this party. It started off as a missed connection. Hey, I saw this on social media, and, and something was missed in the moment. But now that we've seen it, hey, we, we want to change it. We want to do some things. We want to make it right. And they actually find this. This, this individual, they find him, and they throw this party, and he went on ABC, and he went on, he, I mean, he just went everywhere traveling, and he would do these interviews um, during that time, and launched a foundation, and just used it in a way to really help people that were in need, and especially people that were being publicly shamed. Come on, isn't that powerful? Missed connections, and Nicodemus had a missed connection because in John chapter 3, it tells us that he came to Jesus at night, which tells me that Nicodemus had already seen Jesus during the day. So can we just talk about something real quick? Because here's a Pharisee. Here's a religious leader. Here, here's somebody of social status. Here's somebody that is not only educated, but he's a teacher. So he's, he's able to educate. He's, he's, I mean, he's a leader both in the church and in the Roman world. He's, he's, he's wealthy. And here's this person of status and stature coming to Jesus in the middle of the night. He's hiding in the darkness because it was not popular to be associated with Jesus, especially if you were a Pharisee. See, the Pharisees didn't like Jesus. They didn't like what he was teaching. They didn't like what he stood for. They didn't like the miracles he was doing. They really believed he was a false God. And he was a threat to their power and status and wealth. And so as a collective group, they really were not for this guy named Jesus but how many people know you can't just throw the whole collection out, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, because here comes this Pharisee who wants to know Jesus. I think sometimes we can look at a group, and the Pharisees even get a bad rap, even through Scripture, like, oh, the Pharisees. But hey, can, can I talk about Nick real quick? He's, he's a Pharisee, but he wants to know about Jesus. He was actually one of the least likely to be considered wanting to know about Jesus. But somebody handed him an Easter invite and said, Jesus is going to be here uh, at night. And so he shows up, knocks on the door, ask, and you shall receive. Knock, and the door will be opened. And he has a conversation with Jesus in John chapter 3. And the conversation is interesting because not only does it say that he went to go talk to Jesus, but it also says that after he had, had spoken to him, Jesus says, you will never see the kingdom of God if you're not born again. 
So Nicodemus has a very simple answer to that. Well, what does that really mean? And it's scripture. Are we supposed to go back into our mother's womb and then be born again? He took it literally. And him and Jesus have this conversation about what it means to not only be born with water, but be born by the spirit. And and then Nicodemus continues to ask questions. And and Jesus says, you know, the son of man needs to be lifted up like Moses with the snake in the wilderness. And he starts referring to some Old Testament scriptures. It was a missed connection, but now it was getting connected. And, and, and they started having this conversation. And Nicodemus's, I imagine, eyes are starting to get opened. Because deep down, Nicodemus is searching for something. He's searching for something. I titled the message today, I So or in search of, in search of. And I want to propose that maybe today we are all like Nicodemus. We are all searching for something. There's, there's this, there's, there's just something inside. It's built into the DNA that we're actually longing. Scripture says that we long for a savior. It's actually in the heart of every man, woman, and child. There's, there's, there's this thing, and Nicodemus is looking for something. He's already educated. He's already wealthy. He's already has social status. He has everything that the world would tell you you would want to have, and he's still hungry. He's got access to a 24-7 buffet, but he's still not satisfied. There's the, the food is great. I mean, it's fine. Dine. It looks good. But I got to tell you what this world has to offer me does not fully satisfy me at a soul level. And so he goes looking for Jesus in the middle of the night. See, there was something about seeing Jesus in the middle of the day. There was something about this guy, Jesus, that Nicodemus looked from afar with his posse. Yeah, that's that Jesus guy. We're going to get him. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get him. Oh, yeah, we're, we're going to figure out a way to kill him. We're going to figure out a way to do away with this guy. Yeah, yeah, we are. But inside, he's going, but I kind of want to talk to him. But I kind of got some questions. Can I tell you, that's our society right now. That's why Easter is so special in inviting somebody. Because they may look like they have it all together, but on the inside, they're in search of something. That, this is the good news of the gospel, that as a church, we get to say, no, 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 it's not about perfection, it's about knowing the perfect one. I, don't, I can't live perfect, but I, I, I know someone who did and can and will. And he changed my life. See, Nicodemus is in search of something. And Jesus sees that he's in search of something. So when he shows up at the door, they start having a theological discussion about some different things through scripture because Jesus knows Nicodemus is an educated Pharisee. So he says, well, you're not going to see the kingdom of God unless you've been born again. And Nicodemus says, well, what, what does that even mean? What is Nicodemus actually searching for? What were the Pharisees searching for? Well, they were searching for the Messiah. There was all these prophetic words. Israel grew up as, as just small children learning that a Messiah is coming. He's going to come and he's going to restore our rightful status. He's going to lead our kingdom. He's, he's going to be the king above all kings, the Lord above all lords. He's going to establish reign and rule for eternity. These kids grew up learning that there is a Messiah coming and they learned about the signs of this Messiah, Yeshua, who was going to rescue them from bondage and slavery in this world. He was going to establish a world order and a kingdom. The Pharisees are waiting for this Messiah, this king, this warlike person to come and redeem the social status of Israel. And Nicodemus is going, maybe it's this guy, Jesus. But even though Jesus was fulfilling all the prophecies and signs, there were still questions because they didn't like the way Jesus did it. Isn't it funny that oftentimes the thing that we're searching for might be right in front of us, but we, because it's not packaged the way that we thought? Sometimes the thing that we're praying for, God's already giving you the answer, but it's not packaged the way that you thought. Sometimes the thing that, that you've so desperately been searching for, God has already provided, but it's not packaged the way that we thought. And Nicodemus starts to be, get curious and wonder and show up and knock on the door. And Jesus has this conversation with him. What is some things that I think we search for and Nicodemus is searching for? The first one is this, searching for significance. Can you imagine being the one that found the Messiah? 
Can you imagine being the one that said, hey, since we were children, we've been waiting for this person to come, and I found it. Do you know how significant Nicodemus would be if he was the one that started to err and, 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 and share and say, this is, this is the, remember how we've been waiting? We found him. Oh, Nicodemus, you're so cool. He's searching for significance. See, one of the cultural beliefs and the reason why Jesus is talking about being born again is because at the time, Nicodemus is under the illusion that just because he's from the seed or a child of Abraham, he's automatically saved. There was, there was this belief system that because of my heritage, I'm better than. There was this belief system that because of who these people were or my forefathers were or because of my social status, because of the heritage, I'm just better than everybody because we have the line of the king coming from us. And so I can live however I want because of where I was birthed from. And so Jesus says, well, nobody's going to inherit the kingdom unless they're born again. Nicodemus says, why do we got to be born again? We're born of the line of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. We come from a lineage of kings and kingdoms. I'm, I'm, I'm a Pharisee and educated. My social status has defined my life. Do you, do you not know who I am? I'm already significant. Then why are you still searching for significance? Can I give us just this thought? Be aware of who or what you allow to define you. Be aware of who or what you allow to define you. Because Nicodemus is not ready for this conversation with Jesus. He says, oh, okay, you got to be born again. What is Jesus doing? He's breaking down all the false beliefs or lies that Nicodemus has grown up believing so that Jesus can get the heart of Nicodemus. See, you think you're rescued by the line of Abraham. Yeah, that's where my heritage comes from. Yeah, it's... You actually have to be born again. Well, I don't know what that means. Let's talk about it. And he just starts taking some of these lies that he grew up, these searches that he's looking for, and he's saying, hey, I'm going to restore Israel, but it's not going to look the way you thought. See, they had thought he was going to come and be a warlike king, overthrow Caesar and Rome, kick in the front door. This is Sparta, you know what I mean? Like just, they were waiting for that. They were waiting for for this type of king. Draw Butler in an action movie. You know what I mean? They're just, they're waiting for that to go down. They're like, this is who we're looking for. And then here comes this servant on a donkey. This man who has so much self-control, he allows himself to be put into human form, but he's still God. Here's this person who does miracles and eyes are opened and ears are opened and minds are renewed and people's lives are transformed, but he's not taking money. Here's this person that comes in and goes to the cross and dies and three days later rises again from the grave. Who is this king like Jesus? Nicodemus is is seeing miracle after miracle, but it doesn't fit in with the picture and the box he thought Jesus would fit in. He was allowing things to define his life that didn't have the right to define him. All because he was searching for significance. What else was he searching for? He was searching for acceptance. In John chapter 7, it says, the officers then came to the chief priest. This is later. Nick Nick, Nick hangs out with Jesus one night and he goes back to his posse, goes back to his crew. Anybody, Anybody ever been there before? You're like, me and Jesus are cool, but I still got my thing going, you know, (laughs) figuring it out. So he goes back to his crew and it says the officers came to the chief priests and the Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him? Some context, the Pharisees have a plot. They're going to go arrest Jesus, try him, and, and, and basically a religious council, try him and then find him guilty, and then hand him over to Rome so that Rome could do away with him. And, 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 and so they send these Roman centurions, they, they, they send these guards to go arrest Jesus, and, and these guards go to arrest Jesus. I love it. And, and, and when they get there, Jesus is teaching in the square, and it's like they forgot why they were sent there. You know when you tell your kids, 
to go clean their room, and then they get there, and they forgot why they were there. I'm like, what was I doing? I don't know. I think I came up here to play. You know, like, you're like, what? Or maybe you go to the kitchen because you need to get something. When you get in the kitchen, you have to walk back to your room because you're like, I forgot why I went in the kitchen, you know? It says, the officers came and the chief priests and the Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him in? Why did you not arrest him? And the, and the officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. They got there to arrest him and they were so captivated by what he was preaching. They forgot why they were there. The Pharisees, have you been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? Have anybody who's popular, has anybody who has some social status, has anybody who has some significance or some money, do you see them following him? But the crowd that does not know the law is accursed. And Nicodemus, hello, who had gone to him before and who was one of them. Oh man, I think this is some of the most powerful moments because here's Nicodemus standing with his old life. But he's made a decision for a new life. But he's not completely out of his old life. But he still has a brand new life. And scripture is identifying the tension of the bridge between the two and what happens when somebody has an encounter with Jesus that's so radically transforming, but yet the reality of where they're still standing looks like their old life. Because Nicodemus is searching for acceptance. And I love this because here is somebody who is with them, who said to them, who's standing there, who had gone with them, but he had, he had just spoken to Jesus a couple nights ago, and now he's standing with this crew, and the crew is saying, have any of us believed in him? Nicodemus is like, you know what I mean? I'm kind of starting to believe, you know, I can't really say that because that would not be socially accepted. Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? Nicodemus says this to his crew, and they replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. Can I explain what that means? They're like, none of the Pharisees are following him. That's what they're telling the guards. And Nicodemus, in an effort to protect Jesus, who he's starting to grow in and love and follow, says, hey, 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 doesn't the law say that we should just see what would happen? Because if it's from God, it'll be from God. But if it's not from God, it'll go away. So let's just leave him alone. And the Pharisees say, who are you? What, are you with them? I don't want to say like I'm with them, you know. They said, what? From Galilee, it's the region in the town. Go, you're educated. Go look it up. There's no prophet from Galilee. They didn't like that region. They didn't like that area. They didn't like that land. Well, if we could teach the Pharisees. I, I would. I would like them to know a prophet did come from Galilee. His name was Jonah. I don't know if you caught on. Like if I was Nicodemus, I'd be like, hey, they're. Actually, yeah, there is, they're over here trying to throw insults, but they're, they're missing the point. He said, no, 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 there was a prophet from Galilee. It was this guy named Jonah. Well, what happened to Jonah? Well, he was supposed to go preach good news to a Samaritan city. It wasn't even the Jews, so that God could rescue them. But he ran the other way, and in running the other way, he was disobedient from God. But then there's this little, weird little picture of where he gets thrown overboard and gets put into the belly of a whale for three days. And this whale drops him on the shore of his calling and his purpose, and he does give a prophetic word to Nineveh, and they do get saved, and they are rescued, and he was upset because he also had a preference just like the Pharisees did. And what was happening in this moment? Here's the missed connection. The insult that they used was the proof of Jesus' identity. Is there a prophet from Galilee? Actually, yeah, there's a guy named Jonah. He spent three days in the belly of a whale. Well, don't worry. My Savior is going to spend three days in a grave, and he's going to come up out of that thing too. 
It was a picture. It was a connection. God was already showing you who his son was all the way from the beginning, even the educated, the uneducated, the social high and the social norm. Everybody was able to be involved and get to know his son. He was accessible. Why? Because the acceptance that you're looking for is coming from this person named Jesus. It was a, it was a picture. I'm looking for the dancing man. You're going to be accepted by somebody or something. Be aware of who or what you allow to influence you. Because Nicodemus is standing with some pharisaical influencers, but I'm telling you, they are going to have an influence on your life. And the thing that you allow to influence you is the thing you'll find acceptance in. Find acceptance there. And the third thing I believe Nicodemus is looking for, or he's searching for, He's searching for a savior. He's searching for a Messiah. He's searching for a rescuer. Can I tell you, I think this day and age, especially uh, with all the superhero movies that we have coming out, the redemption stories that we have coming out, we love a good redemption story. We love a good hero. We love somebody that can rescue somebody in their greatest time of need. Why? Because it's been put in you from the very beginning that God would send a savior, a rescuer, somebody who can take you from your place of needing significance and acceptance from this world and turning it and getting your significance and acceptance from his son. I know you're searching for something. I know you're hungry for something. I know you want your life to have significance. I know you want to feel accepted. But can I tell you, be careful what you allow to identify you and define you and influence you because you will find your acceptance and you will find your significance from all kinds of things that this world wants to tempt you with. We can find our significance in work. We can find our acceptance through some friends that we ought not to be hanging around. I shared this, well, mainly share it with this section too. I was sharing this with a, with a friend of mine, uh, just something that like helped me navigate relationships as I was growing up. How many people know nav navigating relationships is difficult, especially in the day and age of social media. I did not have so, many, so much access to so many different people that don't know anything about my life, but I've allowed to influence and define me. I just, I, and I've only been here 32 years coming up, but I, I've just never seen it at this scale where everybody has a voice, everybody has a platform. Just because I signed up with my, all you need is an email to have a platform. You just type in my email and all of a sudden I got something to say and, I, and you try to get people to listen to you and, 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 and there's all these social things that are happening, but there's the, the way I've helped navigate relationships, really people fell into two mindsets. This is how I defined my friends but still kept the calling of what Jesus had for my life. So everybody fell into two categories. You were either on the mission or you were the mission. Two categories. You were either on the mission. Well, what's the mission? It's the Great Commission. Go out into the world, baptizing the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, making disciples unto men. It's the mission Jesus gave. We're not making up our own mission. It's the one he gave us. So we were either, we were either on mission together, reaching people, or, or, or you were the mission. You were who we were supposed to be reaching. But here, here's the defining line. The ones who got to influence my life and define my life had to be on mission with me. Because if you're not on the mission, then I'm allowing the mission the people I'm trying to reach, the people that God's heart is after to start defining my life and I'll start conforming to the ways of the world instead of transforming lives the way God called us to. Our searching, we're searching for Savior. And Nicodemus is no different. Last one, I'll say this. Be aware of who or what we allow to save us. Because I'm telling you, we are all running to a savior in some way. Some of us are running to substances at the end of our day to save us from the day we just had. Some of us are running to relationships to save us from the lack of love that we feel. 
Some of us are looking for words from people that are just lying to you to fill that void of maybe words we didn't have when we grew up. We're searching for a Savior. So beware of what we allow to save us because the thing that saves you, you will serve. The thing that saves you, the thing that rescues you, you will serve it. And if we're not careful, we'll start serving substances. We'll start serving other people. We'll start, ser- we'll start getting our identity and our significance and our value from those things. And Jesus is having a conversation with a man named Nicodemus in the middle of the night. And he's saying, I don't care if you're a Pharisee or not, if you're highly educated or not, if you're really wealthy or not. I don't care about your social status. There's just one thing I require is that you be born again, that you be invited into something new, that you make a decision to follow me because that will bring your life significance. That will bring your life acceptance. That will satisfy the hunger that you could not find in this world. See, what I love about being somebody who's an inviter is that we are already have a king who invited us. Check out this story. It's a pretty powerful story. It's how long way an invite can go. Hi, my name is Felicity, and I've been at Girl Life for only a few months now, but it has been a beautiful few months. I was first invited by my friend Landry. She had asked for help with photographing the service where it was announced that Girl Life had bought a building and was going permanent. It was such a big deal and being friends with Landry prior, she was really excited and emotional about this particular weekend. So I agreed to come and help and that's what really opened the door. What was so special about the invite was that I actually went to school here at Veterans Elementary when I was little and I had a rough childhood with a lot of trauma and the school always brought back just so many horrible memories for me. But coming back here, watching and being a part of a singular moment, seeing the joy, love, and passion that the people here had about what God was really about to bring them into brought revival to my life in that moment. My experience here has really shown me that you can't be in an environment where God is vividly present and walk away the same. The place I always avoided instantly became a place that I desperately desired to be. God took an opportunity within the opportunity for the church and used it to bring revival to my life. He showed me that he can bring something back to life and bring it back to bloom more so than ever before. And I've been here ever since. Walking into a place that is truly just on fire for God is what made me stay. These past few months have brought more growth to my relationship with God than being raised in a church ever truly did. Since being at Grow Life, I have gained a confidence in my relationship with God. I've found truth that I am God's child and I belong and I'm unconditionally loved with no prerequisites. I've found freedom in my trauma and I am on a journey of finding peace knowing that I will always be okay because God is always who He is. Being invited here brought these things into my life. Just one invite opened the door crack, which allowed healing and beauty to enter my life. And I couldn't be more grateful. Come on. It starts with an invite. It starts with an invite. An invite to home. Ask and you're going to find, knock and the door will be open to you. If I had one main takeaway from today, yeah, we're searching for significance. Yeah, we're searching for acceptance. Yeah, we're searching for a savior. If I had one takeaway today out of that verse, search and you will find, ask and, or ask and, and you will receive, knock and the door will be open to you is this. You often will find what you're looking for. Well, often we will find what we're looking for. The trick is, understanding where we're receiving it from because we're going to the enemy will give you a savior too the enemy will give you influence and acceptance as well it just ends in death and what I love about Felicity's story is that a place that meant death for her physically like a, a building that her elementary school a place that meant trauma God brought her to that same place to bring healing God brought her to that same place to bring redemption God brought her back to that same place. In the middle of your largest trauma or need, God will bring you there. He will restore it. He will redeem it. He will strengthen it. That's the type of Savior that we serve. 
He doesn't just he doesn't just allow you to sit with all those memories and all those traumatic events. He says, watch me heal it and make it a testimony. I'm going to turn it around so that you've got a story to share. I'm going to get the shame off of you so that you can say it boldly because it's in my weakness, Scripture says, that I am strong. It's in my weakness where his strength comes from. Everybody's searching for something. Can we bow our heads and pray? If you're in this place, I just want to ask two groups of people a question. Maybe in here today, you're saying, I'm searching for something. I feel empty. But I need God to fill me up with something new today. Just put your hand up. Put it right back down. Anybody in this place? Yeah. Okay, I see those hands. I need God to fill me up. The second group I want to talk to today is you're in search of a savior, just like Nicodemus was. And I just want to invite you on the count of three to make that decision today to, to say yes to Jesus, to decide to follow him today. He's a good savior. And so one, you need to know if you make this decision, it'll change your life forever, but it doesn't just change it in an instant. Two, you need to know that God loves you. And three, put your hand up, put it right back down if you want to make a decision to follow Jesus right now in this place and online. Amen. Well, Jesus, I want to thank you for your church. I pray strength over your church. God, I pray everybody that raised their hand that was in a time of need, that just needed to be filled up again, that you would fill them in Jesus' name, that they would be strengthened in Jesus' name, that whatever they've been searching for, that they would find it in you. Whatever they've been hungry for, they would find it from you. God, all the temptations that try to take their acceptance and their significance be broken off in Jesus' name, that they would find their significance and value from you. God, I pray that they would know when you're speaking and when you're leading and what you're saying to them, give them an identity that strengthens their purpose for the call that you have for them. And if you want to make a decision to follow Jesus today, just, just pray this out. The Bible says that when we confess with our mouth what we believe in our heart, that's how we're saved. And so just say this out. Say, Jesus, today I choose to follow you. I give you my life. I give you my past sin, present sin, and future sin. And I ask that you would change me from the inside out. I believe you died on the cross for my sin. And you rose again from the grave so that I could be made new. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Hey, thank you for watching our Grow Life Church YouTube channel. Our hope is always to help you better connect to all that God has for you. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a thing. Fill out a digital connect card so that we can stay connected with everything that's happening in and through our community. You can also support the mission by giving online as we continue to bring people into a growing relationship with Jesus. Thank you again for watching. We hope to see you soon.